Hi, my name is Father Jerry McGlone. I'm a Jesuit priest and a senior research fellow at the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs at Georgetown University. Thank you so much for joining us this day of TEDx Georgetown, where indeed a drop can create a ripple. The title of my talk is Finding the Words Transforming Trauma. What I'd like to do is start with a quote of one of my favorite authors. Words are things, I'm convinced. Someday we'll be able to measure the power of words. I think they are things. I think they get on the walls, they get in your wallpaper, they get in your rugs, in your upholstery, and in your clothes, and finally, into you. In order for us to measure the power of words, I think we first need to find the words. There's an old statistical axiom that you can't measure if you don't know what's there. So I'd like to begin with a story of my own life and how I came into clinical psychology and this topic of researching the clerical sexual abuse crisis in the Catholic Church. Trust me, it was not by choice. I was driving to my first pre-doctoral -inter pre internship in San Diego, California. And it was a foggy Monday morning. There were sirens sort of swelling in the background and I didn't think anything of it and I was really on time and thinking that this would be an exciting day. When suddenly, clear out of the blue, this man being chased by the police broadsided me at over 55 miles an hour. Shattered pelvis, broken hip, many months of healing forced me to wake up to a lot of realities I had buried. Uh, I didn't forget them, I had just buried those memories. One of the cherished memories I have now is that period of time when I was healing. See, my mother had passed away some nine months prior to that accident. And so my dad was able to come out and help me in this healing process, which was pretty arduous. What was striking was I never knew for years why I so resented my dad and why we had a sort of off and on relationship, though clearly we were still very much in love with each other. Well, I sort of had an aha moment in that healing when my dad started to teach me to walk. And I remembered my aunts and uncles telling me that, Jerry, you know, when you were growing up, you were the kid who was always wrapped around your dad's legs. You see, I grew up in a family of eight. I was the sixth of eight. My dad had three jobs in which he was trying to put food on the table and send us all to Catholic school, which was not cheap at the time. But those months after that accident provided us with an opportunity to heal relationship and to heal that relationship through telling each other's story. That's had an enormous impact in my life. But what also happened at that time was I also had to face other losses. My dad left uh, around Christmas time and unfortunately came back again to San Diego to help my sister go through chemo and radiation because she was then diagnosed with breast cancer. It was later in the summer when he left to go back to Philadelphia and he was experiencing some discomforts following. Come to find out he had advanced stage esophageal cancer and we believe the radiation in the attempt to cure that cancer might have damaged his heart. So on September 14th, he passed away in his sleep peacefully. Remember for us Catholics, September 14th is the Feast of the Triumph of the Cross. The car that broadsided me was speeding down Santa Cruz Street. Sometimes we're all forced to be at the foot of the cross, not of our own choosing, just as the disciples and Mary, the mother of God and the women of Jerusalem. It was nine months after my dad's death that my sister passed away of cancer. So, being a clinical psychology student, I ended up in therapy. And one of the things I had to realize in therapy was that indeed my own childhood was not just bereft of my father being around, but had been tarnished by a Jesuit priest who I had known in high school, who both emotionally, physically, and sexually abused me on a regular basis, both as a high school student and as a young novice and as someone in formation. You see, he was vocation director, high school teacher and formator. 
I certainly knew that this had happened, but my distorted beliefs, my inability to find the words as to what this was, was really part of the brainwashing that any perpetrator does and how they think that indeed what they taught you was love when in reality it was abuse. So that first period of time of me finding my words really transformed a set of traumas and a set of losses for me. What also occurred at that time was um, in 1992, during this time period, a family violence professor was walking down the hall and just, you know, referred to me saying, Jerry, you know, you're a priest. How about if you look at the front page of the New York Times and, you know, work on your dissertation on that? And for many of you who may not know, 1992 was the first time the United States Catholic Conference of Bishops was dealing with the sexual abuse crisis, the famous case from Louisiana had come forward, Jason Berry's book had been written. But as you and all, you and I all discovered in the 90s, the church was not willing to deal with that. But what happened to me was striking in the sense that dealing with those losses, dealing with my own sexual trauma history, I started researching sexually offending and non-offending Roman Catholic clergy. The title of my dissertation was indeed that and characterization and analysis. So I didn't graduate in two years, but I graduated in 2001. It was in many ways that experience coupled with the experience of being in a fairly active and just dynamic parish that really allowed me to walk in a whole different way of being. See, what I discovered in these parishioners at St. James Parish in Solana Beach was that I didn't need to be a cleric. I didn't need to be in my priestly role to be accepted for who I was. They called me Father Job at that parish because of all the misfortunes and all the calamities that had been in my life. And they taught me in a very special way how to rediscover my vocation, how to rediscover my own priestly identity and my Jesuit identity. That had all basically disappeared within a couple of years. I was betwixt and between. I didn't know what to think, what to believe, and I certainly had doubts about the fact that God was indeed there. In my anger and my disbelief, in my processing all those losses, what I realized was I had to make the church my own. I had to make my Jesuit vocation my own, not dependent upon my perpetrator and not dependent upon the organizations of both the church and the Jesuits. That was a profound moment of finding my words and transforming trauma. The third aspect of really finding the words and transforming trauma really is about the ways in which we have to look at what happened in the church. 1992, as I said, was the first time, and then we all found out in 2002 what indeed the church had not done and how they had put survivors last. There's a line in Spotlight which details the cover-up and the years of neglect and abuse of an institution that really highlights the way forward and understanding what happened. In that there's one line that says, if it takes a village to raise a child, then it sure, surely takes a village to abuse a child. What we now have discovered in the more recent you know, scandals of the Pennsylvania Grand Jury Report and the McCarrick scandal, and now trying to process the McCarrick report, there is little doubt that we have a systemic issue here, a systemic way in which the voices, the words, the acknowledgement, the reality of the survivors has never been put first. In many ways, we made the mistake that I was often taught not to do in graduate school, that if you treat sexual offenders, if you just listen to sexual offenders, then your world is warped, your perspective is biased, and you do not hear, you do not even see, you do not even know the pain of what it means to be a survivor of the pain of that perpetrator. Unfortunately, the church not only covered up for the perpetrators, but so did many other systems of police, of our own sort of way of thinking about clergy, of families who did not believe their, their children who came to them, and of many other systems within the church that hid and concealed what was going on, most especially the insurance companies and the church lawyers. It was the press from the outside. It was 
those from the outside, the lawyers from the outside that have continued to force us to face this reality as unpleasant as it is. But that inability to hear and find the words of the survivor from the beginning meant that we were listening to and only hearing the words of the abusing church and the abuser. That did not cause transformation as now we see in black and white in the McCarrick Report. The final way in which we have an opportunity to get it right is to put the stories of survivors front and center. That's the research I've been privileged to do here, having been invited by President DeJoya into this university in order to advance forward some knowledge, some way of recognizing a new path forward so that we don't repeat the saga of 1992, 2002, 2018, and now. It begins first and foremost with listening, acknowledging, knowing, and accompanying the survivor. That's what I'll be doing by recording their stories and figuring out which ways are more effective so that perhaps all formation classes and seminaries, all religious leadership trainings, all pastor trainings, all catechetical trainings would always begin with the survivor's story first. It would be uncomfortable. It is uncomfortable to sit in the pain of someone else's experience. Many theologians have said perhaps that's the moment we're called to. That whether we like it or not and unwillingly we have to go to the foot of the cross as a church and as individuals. Because being at the foot of the cross then we have a story to tell. Just as they gathered in the upper room in order to, sh to share what they saw, what they heard, and to come to some sense in the chaos of what that upper room must have been like, so too we are beckoned into that same spiritual and psychological moment. When I first started being a therapist, I started in what was called a suicide hotline. My mentor at that time said to me, you know, Jerry, you really uh, are going to do what every good parent, what every good person will do when a friend comes to them and saying, you know, I'm really out of sorts. I really am in pain. I just want to get through this day and I really don't think I can make it. And we unintentionally will dismiss this person's perspective and feelings by simply saying, oh, you'll be okay. She said, that's the worst thing you could say to someone on a suicidal hotline. And she used this image, I hope you find helpful today. She said, Jerry, it's much like sailing, you have to sail into, you have to steer into the pain, steer into the wind in order for any movement to occur, for any dialogue to occur, for any ability simply to be present to the pain. In finding the words, in being able to transform trauma, you and I as a church, as a society, need finally and for the first time in many ways but the stories of survivors ever before us. We do that every Triduum, don't we? When we recall Holy Thursday, Good Friday, and Easter Sunday. That same rhythm, that same salvific rhythm where we see life and death is, I believe, our destiny in this moment. If we are to make sense of the horror of the McCarrick Report, the Pennsylvania Grand Jury Report, we must begin and re- exert our efforts to undo the wrong that was done in 1992, 2002, and 2018 and put survivors first. In our finding our words for this horror, in our listening to the stories of survivors and putting them first, I believe we can transform the trauma of those individuals who've been so scarred by these perpetrators and this church and begin to look at the situation that it's not just the bad apples, but indeed the bad apple in the bad barrel that needs our attention. You and I are summoned, whether we like it or not, to an incredibly difficult moment. We can run from the pain or we can steer into the pain. And in that, finding our words can transform trauma and indeed a drop creates a ripple of change. Thank you.